The point is, is that there has to be some flexibility in programming from week to week. And when there isn't, then it, it's not optimal. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't work. I've had times where a template, a DUP template or a block training template has garnered three or four massive PRs for a lifter. But I, I still wonder if I had been a little more flexible, if I couldn't have even achieved a better result. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. You're listening to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I am here with Nikki Sims and Andrew Jackson yet again Hello. in the library. Made up of 50% books and 50% whiskey. <laughs> 30% books and 70% whiskey. Somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, a lot of wood f- wood in the room, floors and walls and whatnot. And there's a of. buffalo fur rug. And right. a buffalo fur, yep, that is, is it correct. a pelt or a rug? Uh, um, I don't know. I'm not, I mean, Maybe it's the both, size that makes a difference. I mean, it is clearly a pelt. But it's made to be rug. These so, are the important questions. Smells of rich mahogany. Yeah, there. it's kind of one of those rooms. <laughs> that's, uh, which, in my defense, I have done nothing to since we bought the house. So it's not like I bought the house and then decided to make a room with massive wooden walls and shelves. And He actually all. just, it only came as this room and then he built a house around it. <laughs> this room was definitely the room that sold the house I was going to say, us. wasn't this the oh, why sure. you bought it? Yeah. And that's actually really nice. sort of accidentally, this was the very last room we saw. So we really liked the house. And it, it wasn't because I had a real estate agent that knew what order to show us the rooms. It just, we got lucky and happened to see the whole house, love the house, and then walked into this room and it was like, oh, I was like, this is it. I was like, baby, this is the house. That's really <laughs> like, good. Oh, my grandchildren will come up on my, climb Aww. up on my knee in this room. Uh, oh, you saw it I'll all flash before I'll be smoking a pipe and like drinking a whiskey. <laughs> That's really cute. So, uh, so we want to talk a little bit today. One of the things I've been thinking a lot about, and I think a thing that makes podcasts hopefully better pod, is when we talk about things that are, we've been thinking about a lot in our own, for me, in my own coaching, uh, to make a content sort of podcast. And one of the things that I ha- I am moving very much away from uh, is percentage-based programs for advanced lifters. And I don't know that that would come as a surprise to people who are hearing this, but I want to talk about why I don't think it works very well. I do think that it works, and I think there is a ton of history the vast majority of of advanced lifters in in any of the strength sports utilize or train under those sorts of percentage based programs and so obviously they've set a lot of prs and they've worked but but my experience has been that i think there is a better way than that when you're setting up your programming for your for your advanced lifters and so i want to kind of talk through the why's and and what i've seen now mm-hmm. after three, four, five years almost now of, of doing exclusive online coaching. And so so being able to program for many, many more people than I was ever able to program for mm-hmm. back when I ran a gym and could only train 12 people or 13 you know clients. So, so we've talked a lot about uh, RPE on the show. And I actually want to talk about RPE some on this, on this show as well. And the way that I am using it now, our listeners all know for sure that I'm not a big fan of prescription RPEs of RPE. There's a rating of perceived exertion and you're basically, you're prescribing the, the weight on the bar, the intensity on the bar based on an RPE number. So you would Mm -hmm. say something like, Hey, I want you to do a tempo squat for five sets of three at RPE seven, which says I'm going to leave three or four reps in the tank. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to leave it up to your lifter to decide how heavy that sh- that is yeah. where there's three or four reps left in the tank. And and I don't think that works very well because, well, for lots of reasons, but one, because it's incredibly subjective. It's based on feel. Uh, Andrew and I, we trained a little while ago. We didn't feel very good at all this morning. We stayed out a little later than normal last night, didn't feel good at all, and, yeah. still, and would have said I was going to have a horrendous training day, and training went fine. Yeah. So it wasn't okay. really about what we felt. Um, and then there are just other problems, obviously, that with if if using RPE in RPE style programs 
if ultimately we're not adding weight to the bar and the goal is strength to accumulate strength or to gain strength, then then we're missing the purpose. And the problem that you get a lot of times with people who go by feel is they'll hit this point and they'll get heavy and then they go through a run of several weeks where the weight actually continues to get lighter. Even you could argue quite easily that the stress goes down. Mm-hmm. There's less tonnage, there's less weight, there's less, and all the sort of metrics we use that would indicate that strength should be going up doesn't. And a lot of times it's just because it feels heavy, right? And you yeah. get to some, at a, at a point for, advanced lifters where the the place where you probably make the most progress is the place where you have accumulated enough fatigue that you're actually in that overreaching spot you're in a place that your body is not used to dealing with Mm -hmm. a a level of stress and fatigue and it must overcome that and adapt Mm -hmm. and that's what makes it better and if we rely on sort of how it feels like well it feels like crap because i'm in i'm in a three week or four week block or cycle where i'm mm-hmm. supposed to feel like crap mm-hmm. right? so that's that's kind of the idea so yeah. so we have these issues for why we don't think prescriptive rpe works here's my question for you guys is what has been your experience with coaching and being coached by percentage-based programs andrew's actually yeah. one of the guys that's finishing up Perfect right timing now because i just went through 12 weeks on a basically a block a percentage based program, program. Yeah. that's right so what, what's been your, your experience for percentage-based stuff? Um, as a lifter, I find that it very much depends on what range of percentage you're dealing with. If it's in the 70 percentile range for volume work, it tends to be reasonably useful. You know, It's giving you something that's typically going to be manageable. Um, regardless of how you are on that particular day. Sure. Um, but as you get up into some of the, the higher eighties and and nineties, um, I find that it's less consistent, I guess I I would say in terms of being able to actually predict what you can do on that day or, or put you or select a weight that's going to be the appropriate stress for that day. Sure. Um, and underlining, underlying that fundamental problem is what percentage of what, Okay, so mm-hmm. I think that's the first question that we have to ask. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the first problem with percentage-based programs are they're all based on something. Right. Mm-hmm. What is it that they are based on, right? Are they based on your previous PR? Or are they Andrew, based on your Andrew, all-time what PR? what are your <laughs> so percentages based what, on? My percentages were based on <laughs> the one RM that I thought would be neat to hit at the that's end that's of the right. cycle. You're like, I'm going to base this entire program <laughs> Yeah, and based on the PR on the he's PRs that I wanted, it, which is not really the point of, of doing percentage. Now it worked for my deadlift, sure, um, but that's probably because I just hadn't really effectively tested my my deadlift sure. in a long time, and so the number that I picked was probably what my actual right one arm potential was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The squat was uh, a good. 50 pounds more than I had the squat target one RM percent or that I yep. chose was mm-hmm. a good 50 pounds more than I had squat in probably three years. Yeah. Oh, it was just the number that I was like, this is what I need. This would this be is, badass. This if would I be could great. Hit it, therefore or I'm going to set. Did you like look program. at Harry Fafudis's squat on Instagram? You're like, it needs to be Harry's squat. Yeah. Basically. yeah there's like, <laughs> no, there's been multiple version. times because Harry's running the exact same program I am uh-huh. on the same week. Oh man. So we're like watching each other's Instagram. <laughs> he like sent me a note about something the other day. And then Matt, a couple of weeks ago was like when I was working on pin presses, he's like, Oh, you need to check out Harry's <laughs> pin press. He really knows how to do it. So I went and watched and their, Harry's. And their numbers are exact. I mean, they're <laughs> right. Not there. at the time. Harry's was higher Harry than Harry was yours. like 60 pounds more than and I then was. You like, beat oh, him hell this no. week. <laughs> <laughs> so I checked my studied pin his press form. Up. <laughs> yep, exactly. I copied it. So then, <laughs> anyway, so that was kind of fun. Um, but uh, yeah, my squat was way too high. Uh, my press was a little bit. I, that was like probably a reasonable i picked a 275 press and i had pressed uh, like 264 i think 265 yeah. so a 10 pound pr and the bench was also probably within range i picked 405 right. and i had done i just barely missed 400 a couple of months ago so did you tell matt that? no no <laughs> this was another problem like <laughs> right, right out of the <laughs> game deal. we never talked about percentage of what which is probably that's that a, that, probably an error. Yeah, on me. That's a, that's a that's a that's a coaching fault. So the interesting thing about the program that you would use is I I I certainly think 
that there are there are some really good programs or templates and that are percentage based out there. And we've talked about this a lot on both the, in the business at Barbara Logic Online Coaching and on the podcast that that that's a program that's not coaching. Those aren't mm-hmm. the same things, right? But it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with a template for people who can't afford personalized coaching or what I think I think it's sort of the next best thing. Um, and the the template based program that you've been on for the past eleven weeks is a block program that that I have used for many, many years, I mean, 15 years, and have slowly tweaked it and slowly tweaked it and slowly tweaked it, where I believe, and it's not because I wrote it, it's because I've been able to just have the data back from the lifters that that did it. I think it is one of the best templates that you could have, and I still don't think it works optimally. Mm-hmm. This, is, yeah. this is the point, right? So I can look at other template-based programs and I can call out the problems of the program itself, mm. the actual programming. But on this one, I think the programming is very solid and mm. I think it still often doesn't get us optimal results. Yeah, And certainly one of those reasons is because we pick the percentages based off the wrong thing for the <laughs> yeah. very beginning. That and you, what I noticed was that the lifts that were responding well to it progressed as you would want that's exactly right and then they're like the upper body lifts in particular and the squat for me um seemed to just sort of derail about three weeks ago yep. or at least i wasn't getting the, the performance wasn't what i was expecting yeah that's it, another interesting thing is you end up programming the press like exactly how you program the deadlift right and we know like those need different things this is great we haven't talked about this at all but to me that's the that's major problem number two mm-hmm. which is that Every percentage-based program, certainly the vast, vast, vast majority of them, program all of the lifts of the same percentage at mm-hmm. the same week across right. the board as mm-hmm. if that you're making the same progress. Right. So, you know, this is my 88% week where I'm doing 88% for yep. four sets of two, mm-hmm. right? And and there might be a little bit of difference in the amount of volume. Like one of the things that I do is I usually will do one, have my lifters do one less set on deadlift than Mm -hmm. they do on the other lifts because I think deadlift is just what I found is a little more stressful. And so, so maybe you're doing five sets or four sets on all the other lifts and you're doing one set less on the deadlift. Right. But when you're doing 88% on squat, you're doing 88% that week on deadlift on a different day at 88%. And one of the things I want to talk to Nikki about is I, I don't know that I have ever programmed you on a percentage based I don't think so. program. I think you've always had weights assigned and yeah. there is some flex built into yours sometimes and mm-hmm. I, I want to talk about that too but one of the things that I think you can speak about better than anybody maybe I've I've ever coached is that you seem to always have one lift or two lifts that are just wham bang awesome you're crushing it mm-hmm. and then one or two lifts that are not just not crushing it but are a deep struggle and a lot of it is because it's well a lot of it is because of, you, you know at this point you've done this for a long time and you've got some you've got some old injuries and some yeah. beat up stuff and so so what is that like to be able to i mean one just to be able to handle it emotionally to say like it's going re- this thing's going really well which is great mm-hmm. and this one is not and we're trying to work on it like, <laughs> oh man i guess it really depends on the day um <laughs> you're right I, there's typically one lift that's going well that may, like keeps training fun um yeah, i've noticed that when my bench starts to peak it doesn't seem to peak well whereas my deadlift will peak really well yeah so um it seems like it goes well until we enter the peaking phase and that's when i enter the deep struggle <laughs> right that's what i <laughs> with a couple of my lifts too. so it's it's um so, kind of similar to what you said andrew is like when you get over that higher percentage range that's where it's a little more mm-hmm. unpredictable um so so think about the one of the things we're trying to do in coaching specifically on the programming side with each lift is we're really pushing for little wins all the time yeah. right mm-hmm. you want little wins mm-hmm. little prs or close to prs or progress right and i think one of the problems there with that per, all the percentages of all the lifts being the same is that you you sort of feel like my experience even for me as a lifter is that I feel like when I hit my numbers and it goes well, then that was a win. Mm-hmm. But there are always a couple lifts going on during that same program that always feel like a loss. Mm-hmm. And then I'm in, and it's more discouraging because in a percentage-based program, you're always numbers chasing. 
you, the whole thing, the whole time, your number's chasing. And if you get sick or you get a little injury or something happens, and you know, like anything or like just life stress happens and all of a sudden you're behind in a hurry and it, and it becomes very discouraging. And I think more often than not, you get this situation where one or two of the lifts is struggling. And so that day becomes sort of the depressing day. You get up and you're like, oh, I have to mm-hmm. bench press right now. And I'm, I don't want to bench press because it's a struggle and it's, I never know if I'm going to be able to hit my numbers. And, but I'm trying to pursue and chase the same numbers at 88% or 90% or 92% that I'm, I'm able to hit easily on my deadlift but I, for some reason i can't hit it on right. the other way and it's not that the deadlift works on these and that the bench doesn't sure. you could you know it's just an example yeah on the on the flip side of that i there were a couple of lifts that on the squat in particular like three weeks ago that i would not have even attempted if you had given me the out with rpe right. or uh you know a little bit of subjectivity I probably wouldn't have done either of the last two lifts that i ended up making yes and one of them was a, a proximal PR, you sure. know, like it was the heaviest I've lifted in probably three years. The second to last single was if you were to show that to anyone on earth, they would say that was RPE 10. And then I added 25 pounds and did another That's single. Right. <laughs> That's right. And what was probably also perceived as RPE 10. Right. Yeah. So no, like there, I, I, think I had an RPE 10 watching that. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's some, there is some upside, you know, to occasionally going into a type of program where you're being assigned something that you just don't know if you're going to actually be able to sure. hit. And, and you never actually will know what an RPE 10 is if you never have that assignment. Sure. You know, and, and I find that's true, particularly the higher the rep range goes, like eights. Yeah. I've hit some eight, sets of eight that I never thought it would sure. physically be possible yeah. when your legs at rep yeah. five start to shake. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people can actually hit a set of eight with their five rep max. Mm. Right. If their life really depended on it. Exactly. Or if, or if they like, don't know how listen, much weight is on the bar. Five, <laughs> right. You hit it for five. Like you could probably hit it for three more. Right. And I know that a lot of people are listening to that being like, there is no way. But I, I have to answer that question all the time with right. my clients who say, that was it. That was all I had. You right. Know? And, I, and so um, the 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 primary problem that I see with with the setup of these percentage based programs or really any template at all, any template, uh, whether it's re- really any template, is that it doesn't allow for any reactionary programming. An RPE based program does allow for some reaction some mm-hmm. reaction changes, but those reaction changes are being made by the lifter under the bar and not by the coach. Yeah. Right? right. So there is some there is some and the problem with a template based program from the coach's perspective is that it is sort of predetermined what all the things are going to be for the entire twelve week cycle when there are times, not just times, but I think with just about everybody who ever does it. There are, there are going to be lifts and days that need to be changed, not just even specific days, but sort of multiple weeks. Like, okay, I can't increase 2.5% every week on this lift. I need mm-hmm. to increase what would maybe equate to 2% or 1.5%. But rather than calling it that, you can just increase the weight on the bar with a prescription of exactly how much weight they can do on the bar. And you can you can you can fix the thing that you just talked about, or the thing that you said that you think was important about that percentage based program, which is which is to say you're going to squat this today, and the lifter says to themselves, "Boy, I, I don't know that I have it in me." Right. And as a coach, you can say, "No, you've got you do have it in you. I've seen it." You yeah. know, you can still do that. And I actually think it's more effective in that sort of reactionary. So I mm-hmm. think with a lot of programs that I'm that I'm moving into. I still have some of those template based programs deeply ingrained in my brain that I mm-hmm. know that in general they're going to sort of work out this way. Right. But rather than just pre planning them 12 weeks out and say, here's the entire thing, mm-hmm. I just go off where the lifter is today or where the lifter has been in the previous week or two. So not any one specific day because you could, anybody has a really great day or a really so crappy day. Kind of have the program as a framework. A yeah, structure, so for example, but then within I, that you can. That's right. So I think the next, um, so the next cycle for for some of my lifters who have done, say, a percentage based block program, they they might go into another block program after this, where the first three or three, four, five weeks 
is an accumulation phase, whether it's it's a higher volume, it's five sets of five, it's that ballpark, it's a lot of volume, it's a lot of tonnage, and I know in general where those percentages, quote unquote percentages, should be. But instead of instead of me letting my lifter choose what the percentages are based on, or being like real a real hard ass about what that percentage is, I can actually then look at their previous week's squat. And say, okay, you squatted five sets of five at 335, and it it was, as a communication tool, I would say, and that was about an RPE 7, and so you're clearly able to make a 10 or 15 or pound jump this week, whereas I could look at maybe what if that same week, five sets of five, you did that same weight, but it was an RP nine and a half. Like, well, I can't make a 15-pound jump this next week. Mm-hmm. And that's not only that. There's not supposed to be RPE nine and a halfs in, in an accumulation, fa- right? Mm-hmm. So instead, what I'm doing is I'm I'm programming. You've seen this, Andrew. Seen this? Like I went from programming twelve weeks at a time to programming a week at a time to for my advanced yeah. lifters, often a day or two at a time. Yeah. Now it creates. You've got to really always stay on top of the schedule, and right. it certainly creates some risk if I get sick or something happens. All of a sudden, people aren't getting their programs, but. But I think I'm actually able to hone in. And what I would guess is I would guess you get about probably a 3 to 5% improvement in in the performance by the end of the – and not literally a 3 to 5% PR. But I just think it, there's, a, there's a small amount of clear improvement where it works better if I'm able to look at the lifter and what they did this – in the in the the past workout or the past five to ten workouts Mm -hmm. and continue to program off of that rather than here's the template the template said we were 86 percent last week we're 88 percent this week and on all four of the lifts Mm. i have a lot of my clients or i think several of my clients on 531 right now yeah and it's interesting because some of them are newer some of them are actually quite advanced and I start off with it being, you know, the template five three one percentage, but then I makes I don't just go up by a spreadsheet. Like it's all make a higher jump for you know the squat or the deadlift, or make a smaller jump for the press or the bench, and then I manipulate the stress a lot with the supplemental lifts that I have. Yes, right. So not everybody's doing the same supplemental lifts. Like the press gets something special, the deadlifts get something different. But that's I found that's a good vehicle for utilizing something that's percentage based and it really is just a cookie cutter template but still making it very individualized do you let your clients do the amrap set at the end of the fight like the way it was typically written originally written um, by windler where yeah i have them do like a leave two reps in the tank kind yes, of thing an yeah. amrap but leave two reps in the tank sort yeah. of thing so so Except that also deadlift. that also gets to work deadlift. in a little bit of that auto regulatory right so what you're doing what what you just explained was there is a a reactionary based amount of tweaks and changes that you can make to the program for the client. Mm -hmm. But because there's that AMRAP set Mm -hmm. then there's also sort of really kind of an RPE based, Mm -hmm. a little bit of auto regulation that the client can make for themselves because they can go. And I've done five, three, one before. And sometimes, you know, the, the rule was, and this, let me be clear. I haven't read any five, three, one, anything since it originally came out. (laughs) So maybe this is not what Windler says, but what it was originally was, on the five week, your last your last set, you have to at least hit it for five. Mm. You hit it for five plus. Yeah. Right now, if you can hit it for nine, you hit it for nine. But there will be times if you do five through one, especially if you do it several several times around, mm-hmm. you'll have some workouts where you'll just hit it for the minimum number of acceptable reps. You're like, yeah. I just felt like crap. Mm-hmm. And I probably could have hit it for seven, but I hit it for five because five is what I know I was supposed to hit it for. And like, if you can't hit it for five, now we we've screwed something up yeah. but, or whatever. So that's kind of interesting to, that you've got some of that reactionary and flexibility mm-hmm. in the way you're programming right now, both by the coach mm-hmm. and by the client, which yeah. I think is, is good. How much do you think the, the percentage or, or even the weight assigned, how precisely does that actually matter? Meaning like if you're in the seventies and it you're doing volume, lifter, work, right? Uh, I, I think it depends on the strength of the lifter, mm. right? Yeah, because there's, I mean, there's going to be more margin of error, yeah. I guess, or or there's going to be more variation or range of ability at the lower percentage. 
just just if by about like five, if a five hundred pound, pound squatter right. does seventy percent, right? There's going to be more. Uh, if you make a five pound change one way or mm-hmm. another, and it's you're a five hundred pound lifter, you made a one percent change, right? One way or the other. But if you're a yeah. female who presses right thirty two and a half pounds, mm-hmm. a five pound change is a tremendous amount, right? Yeah, that that's been a bit of conversation we have a lot with the interns um, right. where people stall out on the press and we're like, okay, well let's look at how much you were adding each yeah. session and they're, they're adding five pounds or even right. just two and a half, half pounds, so but do the math much. on what two and a half pounds yeah. is, is still like a 7% jump right. for That's some right. people. That's exactly right. um, but I guess what, where, where I'm going is whether a, if you are doing volume work and it's for this week, it's 77%, even f- for anybody, any amount of weight on the bar, how much does the stress actually change is the stress change significant whether it's sure. 74 or 78 no. or 75 for, I, I don't believe so for an advanced lifter i think the further away you get from 100 percent, the less that percentage the actual exact yeah 72 and a half percent as opposed to 74 percent. right i don't think it really matters but mm-hmm. i think once you get into the 90s i think the difference between 92 and 94 yeah or 94 and 97 we're sorry. So just like you were saying that you, you can, and, and, and so that's why I think that, you know, in, in the beginning, those percentage based programs, actually those templates might be perfectly fine mm-hmm. as long as they're in the seventies and eighties, because, you know, you can go in and hit four sets of five at, at 74%. And it feels about the same as hitting four sets of five at 78%. Like they're, it's all doable and nothing's too ridiculous. And it's just, how would you maybe describe that? If it's uh, it's heavy but doable, heavy, heavy but doable but doable. HBD. It's <laughs> the new motto for Marvel Legend. <laughs> heavy but doable. <laughs> so, yeah. So, but but if your program for five singles across, yeah, at ninety two percent, or five singles across at ninety five percent, that's a big difference, right? Um, so I think as you get closer to a hundred, I think really being in the, and again, we're still talking and this is the, this is one of the other problems of, or challenges of, of programming is when you talk through programming, you look, think about the programming books that have been written, how else could you possibly describe the program without using percentages? Because you can't use weight on the bar because everyone is so different, Mm -hmm. but percentages create a a real challenge to say, well, you know, this is, if we're going to do this program and it's basically lifting at 74% this week and then 77, and you're you're right, that's true, Mm -hmm. but it just, everybody's so different that, so, so we found that the more we can individualize people's programs, the better. I think we use those minimum effective dose principles. Mm -hmm. I think we start as simply as we possibly can. I think we add a step or two of complexity at a time. And I think what you'll find is um, that works better. And and then what you'll see is when I've done that, and like if I, when I've done that, if I look at Nikki's programming where we haven't used template-based, percentage-based programs, she might be working at 85% on the deadlift this week, and she might be working at 72% of of bench press. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's okay because the goal then is she's still able to get little wins on every lift every single week, even the ones that don't feel very strong or that maybe have, Oh, my shoulder hurts a little bit. We can still get those little wins instead of a God, you know, like that 76% hurt my shoulder last week and the 78% killed my shoulder shoulder this week. You run into a lot of those issues with those percentage. And and I would definitely as a, unless I'm competing on a specific day, I would way rather that be how I lift week after week, you know, is Absolutely. to have those small wins. I don't need to, you know, blow it out and sure. have the absolute best peak ever if I just want to keep training for the next five, 10 That's years. That's right. One of the things you and I were talking about um, earlier this week is the old stories of Vasily Alexiev mm-hmm. who would get paid by the, by the records that he set, right? By the world records. And so, Vasily is a, you know, this great Soviet lifter in the late sixties and early seventies. And he's setting world records, he's a super heavyweight lifter. And the Russian Federation of the USSR would pay him, I think it was $5,000 for every world record he would set. So he just kept setting like one right, kilo world right. records. Well, it's like what floors, he, thousand, thousand one pound deadlift that's right, too. That's right. Did you hear that he get, they got asked afterwards, well, how come you didn't lift more? Or and he was like, "What's the point?" That's right. <laughs> I set the world well, record. <laughs> so what's we- what's weird about that is what's interesting interesting about that, and I, I could be wrong, 
is that I wonder, so the story has always been that Vasily really didn't ever have anybody to push him truly. Like there really wasn't anybody who could really push him, right? You had Redding and you had Patera and there, but like he was just on another level when it came to the totals. The guy was just amazing. And they said, well, if someone had been there to push him a little harder, maybe like mm -hmm. maybe the world records right now would still be standing. And that very well may be true, but I'd like to offer an, an a counter argument, which is the fact that he just kept taking the little wins allowed him to never get uber injured, uber overtrained, get to a point where, you know, you can go back and think of the old Kurt Karwaski thousand three thousand and three mm -hmm. pounds or thousand two. two pounds for a double. <laughs> and that's the best squad of his entire career. And he and he took it and it wasn't programmed. It was programmed mm -hmm. for a single. <laughs> and it was I think it was two weeks out from a meet. Yeah. And he he went for broke and hit it and probably is thankful that he did. I I don't know. But after that it was like he never was able to you know, I think I don't even remember if he squatted a thousand at the meet. I think it was, you know, he ended up squatting, you know, he only squatted nine hundred and seventy right. pounds or whatever <laughs> at, whatever it was at the meet. Um so you know, I, I think, think there Ed is Cohen's an advantage a similar story that he he took a, a rep PR because he had it in his training yeah. where he could hit it that day, but he he kind of looks back at a couple of those and wished he hadn't uh, sort of he had saved it for the meat. Yeah. So there's, and, and obviously there is, I mean, this is almost, you could get into a deep philosophical conversation about this, which is not, not the point. But when I think through, if you're generally healthy, mm -hmm. things aren't really broken and hurting, mm -hmm. uh, especially for the younger population that's listening. So if you're in your twenties and thirties, I think there is a real advantage to sort of, it's almost like holding some cards still in your, mm -hmm. in your, in your back pocket or up your sleeve to go like, Hey, I still have something left to play. If you go for broke, shoot your wad at the big PR on a Wednesday, like what are you doing next week? Right. Like, when the next Wednesday there needs comes to around, there needs to be some runway. That's right. That's right. It's more of a, a training mindset, I think. Than now, certainly at a meet, we don't go for little. We sure. don't go for little. Get every freaking thing that you can. You yeah. know, <laughs> it, except for there are times when I've had lifters who have either they're brand new and they have never competed or have very little competition experience, and for them, and it depends on the lifter. Um, Nine for nine is the goal. Nine for nine is the goal. I want a hundred percent. And I would rather them leave some weight on the platform and go nine for nine because they need the confidence builder. Or I've had a couple lifters I can think of that are advanced lifters and had competed quite a bit, but their previous three or four competitions had been poor. They had mm -hmm. done poorly. Maybe maybe that was with me as a coach. Maybe it was not with me as a coach. And I knew that it was important for them to have a good experience there. And so yeah. then I might. But other than that, and somebody from like me. Once I got to the point where I I really never cared about who won in powerlifting meets, even from the earliest powerlifting meets I did, I don't know what it was about. I think it was maybe because I was reading Powerlifting USA and I was seeing like how strong the really strong guys were, and mm -hmm. I knew I was so far from that. Yeah, I I didn't actually care about showing up and winning a trophy. I cared about showing up and and hitting a PR. So for me. I'm one of those guys that if I went five for nine at a meet but had three PRs. I'm that's great. great. We're day. five for nine and two PRs. Like that's a pretty good day All too. Mindset. Doesn't yeah. bother me at all. <laughs> I, I don't need to go nine for nine. So, um, cause I want to go for broke, but yeah, I've learned in training. It, it is very helpful to go for after the, those little PRs. We can use those metrics, like the metric that we want to use to look at if our training is successful, if our coaching is successful, if our programming is successful is consistent little PRs all the time. Yeah, and the or longer unless you can you're, do that, the stronger you get. Uh, unless you're charity and you misload your deadlift sure. by forty <laughs> pounds and set a lifetime and then accident, PR, accidentally pull a pull a huge PR because you accidentally misloaded the bar. I think every, and everybody I think has had stories like that. Absolutely, and then, you know. And then there's probably times where, listen. Also, everybody has days, and I actually think maybe it changes a little bit as you get older. As now that I'm in my forties, and as over the, if I think about when I was strong over the past, say, five years or so, those times where training was going well for a period of time. I think as you get older, when you have one of those days where nothing hurts and everything feels awesome, yeah. I do think you go for, you the, go for it. You go for the PR. Because yeah. now we're at a point where like few and every between. time I, that's right, and every time I hit a PR <laughs> now, which has been a while, um, I, I literally think to myself, like, that might, that might have been the last PR I ever hit at that lift. And I, that's kind of sad to think about, but it's still, but it's true. Yeah. yeah. You and I were talking about this, about the bench press. I had this thought popped into my head of like the bench press and the press can be so fickle. I almost feel like 
if you're having a good bench press day and you're in that phase of yeah. training where you're supposed to be hitting heavy things, like if bench press feels good, I feel like you should just go for your PR. Yeah. Sure. Because I think that is like that can be easily missed in a peak. <laughs> and the <laughs> but like the, don't do that for a deadlift. And the <laughs> cost is uh, it's not as great in, from right. a stress standpoint. Like yeah. you, especially like the press. If yeah, you if you miss grind a on heavy press, like, um, you're going to be all right. You, yeah, you're not going to be set back for two weeks of training or whatever. Like you can with a deadlift mm-hmm. or, or squat, either and, one or the mm-hmm. squat. Yeah, it's a big opportunity cost for taking that. Yeah, for taking that giant. Yeah, PR on those lists. But yeah, you're exactly right. We think about a press too. Isn't a press the most groove? Like it's the one that deals with the groove. Like it's it's more like an Olympic lift, like yeah. a clean or a snatch, than yep. the other lifts are. Like you can. You can sort of misgroove, especially a bench press or a or a squat, and you can misgroove it a little bit and still get a PR in a misgroove. You're not getting a PR in a press on a misgroove unless you just got a lot stronger than you thought you were. Right. Like you don't misgroove a press and finish it. It's got a groove right. Or if it's a uh, for some reason the USSF me first time lifter grinding out a helicopter press with you know calibrated kilo plates overhead <laughs> it's like that. inevitable it's like every single usf oh, meet i've run in general there's always it's at least terrifying. one it scares me yeah <laughs> yeah it's death. like it's just not worth it it's um, not worth it but for most <laughs> most uh people pressing it's either going to be you're going to know immediately whether it's going to be a, a make yeah that's, um, that's or right. pretty quickly at least so let's give the listeners some actual items that that they can take rather than just so we've set up the here's the arguments for why percentage based programs probably aren't the best option so if you're a lifter and it's probably a little harder question to answer for a lifter than it is for a coach i think for our coaches not just speaking for barbell logic coaches but i think coaches out there who are listening i think you should be aware of and think about as you're programming for your lifters, if you give them a thing that has predetermined the next 12 weeks of programs, period, mm-hmm. it would be the same thing if the weights were, pre- you know, like percentages and weights. And honestly, at this point, RPE scales, they've got all these charts, right, that say, well, RPE 7.5 for this many reps is, you yeah. know, you, you can, is this percentage. Um, I think if you've pre programmed all 12 weeks or 10 weeks or six weeks or even four weeks of your program, and there isn't any flexibility built in, for the coach, for the coach first, but also probably a little bit for the client, mm-hmm. then I think that you are leaving some pounds on the table and some performance increases on the table. Is that fair? I think it's fair. And, and a big part of that is the psychology as well, like the motivation you talked about. Yeah. It's not just technically that the stress may not be as precise or as effective as it could be, but that your risk of getting a client that's not as motivated is higher. Yeah. I think using that because because when you fall behind when you're chasing numbers, it feels like you're failing. And we don't want people to go into the gym and feel like they're yeah, failing. Yeah, cuz when you that, and actually this is something I experienced um and again I talked about it how it did kind of push me to a result that I probably wouldn't have been, done on my own. Yeah. But there's something about getting handed a percentage-based program um, where it feels like this is what you should be doing because it's a design, you right. know, like it's a sure. program design. So somebody had spent time and energy trying to figure out like what you should be able to hit if the program is quote unquote working. That's right. Um, and there's sort of an, I, I felt sometimes like I internalized not hitting when I stopped hitting some of the numbers, like, ah, I screwed up or I, I'm failing yep. cause I should be able to hit this, yep. but there's no, there's no real reason I should be able to, hit it on that particular day i mean that's a good point in theory i suppose but yeah yeah i I, so then i I also want to be clear that i don't think there's anything wrong with template-based programs as long as there is some daily and weekly abilities to make those changes and i think on if we're honest with ourselves as coaches a lot of times because because training and programming complexity has it's for the advanced lifter it's far more complex it has to be, then programming is harder. And so there is a thing, I, you know, I don't think most coaches would say it's laziness, but I think, and I, I've been guilty of it myself, we're like, listen, I know this advanced program works. It's very easy for me to just assign that program to a lifter. When the best thing to do is I could still assign that program to the lifter, 
but then I need to make the daily or weekly changes for them based on how the training is going the past week or two or three have been going though they need, it needs to be adjusted because it's one size fits all doesn't can't work optimally, right? It works optimally for the one person that it's optimal for in the whole world who probably isn't actually even a power lifter or, or whatever right now. So it's a, <laughs> I, th I think the templates are okay as long as you figure out a way to make those changes. And I think for a lot of coaches, they want to just sort of set it and forget it. Yeah. Yeah. And you, and take into account also a lot of the things that are out, happening outside the gym too. That's you know, right. I wish I was living in, at times the Russian training halls. Have you seen some of those videos? Oh, they're incredible. Uh, you know, you've this got my favorite. a hundred 18 to 22 year old yeah. guys that are living in a dorm and their schedule is set every single That's day. Right. They get up, they train in the morning, they eat, they get the massage, the contrast baths, then they nap and they train and they eat. And yeah. it's just seven days a week of perfectly controlled variables. Yeah. Of course, their supplementation also comes in right. midday. Right. <laughs> midday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ivan Drago comes in. He's like, but, uh, yeah, yeah, that sounds that's awesome. Not many people get that life. Well, and I bet it. I bet it's not actually awesome. Yeah. I bet it's only awesome for six months or like at what? Then it point, becomes a job. If ev that's right, if every single minute of every single day was scheduled, even if it was the thing that you were really passionate about and loved, how long would it take before you're like, okay, I'd really like to have a day where I didn't have to go do contrast showers <laughs> and <laughs> lift twice and get you know and take. so you know we got to experience that at the at the korean train hall and the uh, korean yeah. team was is they're a good weightlifting team they're mm -hmm. they're ranked higher than we are significantly yeah and um and so it was interesting to watch that we got to eat food with the uh the with the lifters and oh man you're talking about the most amazing cafeteria food you've ever seen in your mm -hmm. life you know it's this giant cafeteria set up it's and it's really wild too because you had like the super heavyweight female olympic weightlifters that were in that room and then you had like the gymnasts mm. and you had the you know i remember they had the I don't know if it's Greco Roman wrestling or some kind of wrestler. Or so, you know, those are little, little guys with cauliflower ear and they're mm. all in the same room. So it was interesting to, I, I would like, I would sort of sneak and look at what was on their plates. You know, obviously like what the, what the female Olympic weightlifter that weighed 330 pounds was eating was not the same thing as the, as the gymnast. And of course then I didn't know what the kind gymnast of gymnast just got to sit and watch her eat. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. She just she's the gymnast smelled her food and yeah. then the lift the lifter got to eat it, eat it. But no, and, and you don't know what kind of rules are built around it either. But yeah, yeah that's a, that's the 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 point is is that there has to be some flexibility in programming from week to week. Yeah, and when there isn't, then it it's not optimal. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't work. I've had times where a template, a DUP template, or a block training template has has garnered three or four massive PRs for a lifter. But I, I still wonder if I had been a little more flexible in making, I'm talking about little tiny changes, little five pound or 10 pound changes mm -hmm. for the lifter if I couldn't have even achieved a better result. And I certainly think it would have made me a better coach because I think one of the problems you get with the templates and, and one of the problems we can fall into is once you find a template that, right. you, that you like or a template that was made by a coach you trust, and so you assign it to the to the lifter, how much do you actually learn about programming then? when they're just following a template that you lay out. Since I started doing MED, I I don't think I could look at any two of my clients and see the same program. No. It it's just they I have bar speed and kind of re response to variables that I'm used to watching for and I make course corrections for each lift each week based on what how the clients responding. Yeah. And it all kind of they all end up going different directions at different times and I think that's been a huge improvement in my programming since, you know, three years ago when yep. before we were really using MED and going from program to program or template to template, there's just an infinite number of variables you can now plan for and work around. Yeah. So you were saying bar speed is a big, so I was going to ask as a, to kind of wrap the show up, what are the primary things we're looking at that tell us that we need to make a little tweak little heavier, little lighter bar speed is obviously one of them. And that, yeah. again, that's a great and interesting discussion because it's not bar speed for humanity. Mm -hmm. No, it's bar for speed for lifter. only that person. And mm -hmm. so you have got to, you have to have coached that person long enough to really know what their bar speed is on each lift even. Right. So if, if you think about like, I've always been a very fast bench presser. I think it's why I've torn my pecs multiple times because mm -hmm. I'm super explosive as a bench presser. And 
painfully slow squatter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Nikki so. and I were talking about that two podcasts ago. That like the benefit of watching every single session, That's right. providing feedback on every That's single right. session, is that I'm constantly calibrating my eye to the lifters, that lifters movement yes. and how it changes at different percentages or even through the set because different people sure. will lift uh, three reps of a five and have fast it fast and smooth and right. everything's fine, movement right. pattern's fine right. and then it falls like, apart. If you watch uh, Caleb Krieg is really interesting. Uh, he's a hard one to watch bar speed on because especially like on squat, it's fast, 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 bomb. Like, mm-hmm. you know, adding five pounds, like you would see, you don't see any degradation up to the failure. It's just like a light switch that goes out. Whereas other people, you can start to see they they start to grind a little bit. They're More a little bit trip. slower, a little bit slower as you get closer to their one RM. So you have to know each lifter and, and be able to know what to look for or have a means of getting their feedback. Right. So I was going to say, so the, the other thing that I would say is we, I can look at really all of this is sort of subjective. The only thing that's not subjective is if they're hitting the, if, if they hit their numbers, they're hitting their numbers, right? Outside of that, the subjectivity is I'm still looking at the bar speed. If you've got a good coach who can who has a good eye, we're looking at bar speed and movement patterns and whatnot. But I this is where I really do like the RPE as a communication tool from the client back to the coach. So that the client says, This is how hard I felt like it was. And I feel like that's great because it just it helps uh, align the coach and the lifter with how hard it actually was, right? Yeah, and I I was thinking about that when you mentioned it because there were definitely some times last summer, for example, you uh, you had me doing a bunch of box squats. Yep. And I uh, was <laughs> dying. Like, and I was like, please, God, make this look hard enough that he doesn't add more weight. <laughs> and then you just kept adding Perpetual more weight. Perpetual LP on the was like, box I'm squats. going to make this an RP9 yeah. no matter what. <laughs> Because I don't want it to go up anymore. I was trying to make noises, and then I realized, like, <laughs> oh, shit, he turns the volume off. That's right. I don't <laughs> <to> the volume. <laughs> you, had me doing, you had me doing bus squats at the same time, and I think I even messaged you. I was like, and we were going through, a, it was a stressful summer. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, that stuff doesn't make me want to not train. Box squats make me want to not train. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and then like, they were okay. still there week after week after <laughs> week. <laughs> yeah. It's good. It would have been nice to have the option to say RPE 20. <laughs> right. Give you that feedback. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, anything yeah. else? Percentage-based programs? I think that's the deal, right? So they're okay. Uh, there are ones out there that have been proven to work. There's nothing wrong with using them, but I think that when you have all of the weights or all of the percentages pre-planned multiple weeks in advance with no opportunity to make tweaks, that's when we run into a problem. And I think that the tweak, those those little changes that you're going to make to the program is first and foremost, the responsibility of the coach, not the lifter. And I think with RPE-based programs, it puts the, it puts the responsibility or the onus on the lifter, not the coach. Mm-hmm. But I do think it's actually advantageous as you get to know your client more and more and as they become more and more advanced to have a little bit of leeway with both the lifter and the coach. So I think the coach gets to prescribe with a little bit of flexibility. And I think the lifter, giving the lifter an opportunity to make a little bit of change in the moment, uh, especially for online coaches who are not there to see what their lifter is doing in, during the day. I would never let the lifter choose if I coached them all in person right. in real time. And I think should add one thing there that, it's flexibility, but it's not making knee jerk reactions. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think the more experienced you are coaching, the more yes. you're just like, okay, that's worth making a change or nope, that's supposed to be hard. Keep going. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's well, you're walking a fine line there as a coach. I mean, and, and I, we all struggle with it. I mean, the coaches, those of us who have done it the longest still figuring out like, okay, is it, should I make the tweak or is I, you know, sh- should I just tell them to like, you know, like, grow a set and hit it a little harder you know like it's just (laughs) you're that you're you're walking a fine line there and figuring out where that line is where you push your lifter a little too hard is is so individual by the lifter too like what lifters you can what lifters are motivated by that sort of hey like it's time to get a little tougher and do this and they're motivated motivated by that versus if their communication is not great I've had other lifters who weren't telling me they were already in a bad emotional place with the lifting. They were already struggling. They were already not looking forward to lifting. And then I'm like, hey, you just need to get a little tougher. Like, that's not the right message. That's the wrong message for that person. 
uh, it's it's a this. I think the show provides hopefully another good example of why those minimum effective dose concepts work so well in programming. Make that little change, one step at a time, and take care of your lifter. All right, you've been listening to a Barbell Logic podcast. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in a couple of days. If you get a chance, we'd love to have a five star review on iTunes or any of the other places that you pick up the podcast. We are on Stitcher and Spotify. And again, we're still we're working hard with Spotify for that hundred million dollar. Uh, buyout that they did with Joe Rogan. We were also on the table. We were negotiating at the same time. Our our offer hasn't come yet, but so the, any support you can give us on Spotify is helpful because Spotify pays for uh, those reviews. I think for they eventually uh, drive up the value of the podcast. Uh, there's no chance that Spotify. This is for <laughs> it's a complete and utter joke. Spotify will never buy this podcast, but you we'd still lo- we'd still love your five star reviews. It means a lot to us, <laughs> and so thank you for listening. We'll see you in a couple days. Bye.